It's good to see everybody here. Good to see our visitors just come in with us. Uh, as you see, we're on Lesson 30, a book that only has how many chapters in it? 22, and it's like uh, you're thinking, we're never going to get to the end of this book. And even this chapter here, we're in chapter 20, and I had to split this chapter just to cover this as well. So you all have been very patient, tolerant, I think. Some say, I ain't coming for a while, and see if it changes, and you're still in Revelation. You're still stuck in that same book, you know. I don't know, but I enjoy it. I'm learning a lot. I don't know if you all are learning anything, but I've learned quite a bit going through this book. Um, so hopefully you're learning something as we go through here. For those who are here and guests don't know, we have on the front pew over here, we got today's lessons. I hand them out ahead of time. They have it over there, and there's old lessons there as well, and handouts as well also are there. So you got the entire lesson right there, so you can almost teach it yourself. I mean, I was going to tag Brother Brian, but he just wouldn't stand up here and teach it. I don't know why. I just, but, uh, but it's good to have everybody here this morning as we go through it. So turn to Revelation chapter 20, if you would, please. And as you see, we're talking about, we'll go to the table of contents. We're going to talk about the strength of Satan. We're going to talk the first, the resurrection, the resurrection of the saints. We're going to talk about the millennium. Even though in chapter 20, it's, it's referred to, and we'll talk about that. There's various verses that talk about the millennium period there. And uh, so we'll cover that. So that's what the big bulk of this lesson is covering, trying to pull this together to help us understand something about the millennium uh, period that takes place. So. so as I put out here, the first introduction here is the quest for peace. I mean, we hear it all the time. You see people get up and they give a speech, and what do they ask for? World peace. World peace. And I thought this was interesting. I, this is from an illustration here of this, this guy who's the UN secretary, uh, Youthat, I think. He was a Burmese, and he was, uh, he's from Burma. He was the he he secretary general, as you see, of the United Nations from 61 to 71. And he had these scholars together, and he says, you know, the question was, he asked this question about requirements for world peace. What element is lacking so that with all of our, our skill and all of our knowledge, we still find ourselves in the dark valley of discord and enmity? Why is it that for all our professional, professed ideas, our hopes and our skills, peace on earth is still a distant objective seen only dimly through storms and turmoils of present difficulties? People's always asking for world peace. And, I mean, just like he was asking these scholars, people who are supposed to be intelligent people, okay, what is the what's the solution? And we still can't come up with a solution because people cannot come up with a solution with that because why? Why? It's in the heart. The problem is down in the heart. Until they accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, that's where it's all going to keep on, right? And I, I, I saw this too, and I want to share with you. The other part is this wall here. You've probably seen this wall before, and if you knew, but I, it's over in front of an apartment building, right across the street from the United Nations. It was put up there, and on that it's an inscription. It's called the Isaiah Wall, is what they call it. They refer to it. But only part of the inscription is on there. You always know about the famous part of the inscription where it says, uh, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and, and nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But that's only part of that. So I underline the rest of it that it doesn't say, you know, because it doesn't say, and he shall judge among the nations and they shall rebuke and, and shall rebuke many people. Because they didn't want to give identification about who is that. Who is the one who's going to judge? Who is the one who's going to set things straight? The Lord. You know, the, the words sound good, you know, beat, you know, plow, share, you know, beat their swords into plow, share. That sounds great and fantastic. Doesn't it? That's good. They're, they're God's word. Don't get me wrong. But they kind of leave out the part about who is going to take care of things. Who's going to straighten it out? It's the Lord that's going to straighten it out. So this quest for world peace is everybody's, like you said, you, you can see these, everybody gets up, yeah, we're praying for world peace. My, my thing is world peace, you know. Everybody says that and longs for it. And we all like to live in a world of utopia where everything is just, everybody gets along, there's no more fighting, there's no more wars, no many things, those things, just everybody just gets along. But it's not going to happen. Not until later on will it happen. 
And we'll talk about that during the millennium where that's going to take place. Okay? So the restraint of Satan. So turn chapter 20, if you're not already there, chapter 20 of Revelation. And we're going to read these passages here. So read this out of my book. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose for a little season. So open, this opening part here talking about this passage that you see on the screen here, I'm showing you, uh, this is from David Cloud's book. It is interesting that the Bible does not say that this is a mighty angel. Because in other references, there are references to mighty angels doing this. But here he references an angel that's giving power by the Lord to capture, to hold Satan, to bound him up, and to cast him there. And it, like he said, it, could, it sounds like an ordinary angel. And angels are powerful, don't get us wrong. But in other references in the scriptures, there's always ones referred to as mighty angels as well. Okay? But here's just an angel says, he's assigned this task, but what we see is that the devil has no power except that God allows him to have that. You think about it. And for God's purposes are fulfilled, the devil will have no ability to resist his punishment. So at this time, the angel takes hold of Satan and puts a chain on him. And so the question has been, well, look at this part about the, his names, because in that passage here, it talks about in Revelation 12, 9. If you want to turn it, we'll turn to Revelation 12, 9. I didn't put it up there. We can turn. You can simply turn. 12, 9, it says, And the great dragon, the great dragon, was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This is where it's referring back to the same names again, to him, remember? He's referred to as the dragon, which is the embodiment of cruelty. The, as the serpent, he is the personification of guile. As the devil, he is, he is the arch tempter of men. And as Satan, he is the declared opponent of Christ, of course. Interesting, all these names about him, about his character, about him, is being presented here this, again in this passage here about Satan. So, in verse in, going on here, it says, uh, the question about bounding with iron chains. There's no reference to iron anywhere of this because we think of chains, we think of iron and all of that. But he's bound with a chain. We don't know what the chain is composed of. You know, there's no say, okay, this is the right kind of metal that's taken to bind. It doesn't make any difference. It's a chain that God has prepared that will conquer and take over and subdue Satan, no matter what it is. Whatever the chain is made of, it's to conquer and it's God's plan. It's simply a great chain, and we are told of other scriptures, that the spirit beings can be chained because they're in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and also in Jude, talking about uh, angels who are sin and kept their first estate and kept not their first estate and are now what? They're reserved in chains until later on. So Satan can be bound. He will be bound. And he will be bound by the, another angel. And he will be cast where? Into the pit for a while, a thousand years. So what interest is, and I thought this was another point here from Clarence Larkin's book. He says, what, is inter what interests us here, us most, is not the character of the chain, but the fact that Satan can and will be bound and confined in a place where he cannot get out for a thousand years. And while nothing is said of the, of the binding and the confirming of his angels and all the other evil spirits as demons, and the evil powers there, the inference is that they too will be powerless during that period. Because who's their leader? Satan. So he's going to be bound for a thousand years. We know about all the others, what they're going to be doing, but they're not going to be able to do anything either for a thousand years. The binding of Satan reveals the fact that God can stop his evil work, talking about Satan's evil work, when he is ready. When God is ready, he'll stop that, what he does and without sending the armies of heaven to do so. And when the time has come, God will empower and command a single angel to seize, handcuff, and imprison him, just like a, an officer of the law would do as well. You notice Satan is not yet cast into the lake of fire yet, but he's bound and put into the bottomless pit for a thousand years to be. 
without attempting to explain the symbols here, here used, this is what uh, Ironside said, it is enough to say that the passage very definitely indicates that there is a coming time when men will no longer be deceived and led astray by the great tempter who, over, who ever since his victory over our first parents at Eden, who was over Adam and Eve, has been the persistent and malignant foe of mankind and by the, whose wiles untold millions have been, have been defrauded of their birthright privileges. Millions and millions of people have been impacted by Satan's impact on their lives and deceiving people, of course. So the resurrection of the saints, this turns, if you're in Revelation chapter 20, the resurrection, we'll talk about that in verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of, of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And it says here in verse, we'll go on to verse 5 and 6, but the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the resurrection of the saints. I put this together. It shows up here. Yeah. So what is the identity? Cloud asked the question. What is the identity of these people that are on these thrones here? And he says, to learn the identity, you've got to look at several passages here. And the, briefly, he says, the church age saints. Who's that? The church age saints. Who's that? That's us. And where are we going to be? What's going to happen with us? What are we looking for? We're looking for the rapture. The rapture takes place. We'll go out of here instantly, right? They're the New Testament saints. All those who've passed away over time and in the New Testament time. They're the saints, of course, the apostles of will. They're the saints that were saved out of tribulation. They're in the tribulation period. We've talked about that before. The tribulation period, what happens? People get saved during the tribulation period, but what's also happening to them? Many of them are martyred for their stand, accepting Christ, because they will not bow down. They will, just like he says right here, uh, what he said in verse uh, 4, that we're beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not, not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. Those who did not accept that, the mark of the beast, or accept any of that. It's interesting that it says Beheaded. Sounds like there's going to be a lot of guillotine type operations going on getting rid of Christians or those who accept Christ their Savior. You know, doesn't say warring with them or anything, just says execution in that mannerism quickly. And there's Old Testament saints. Of course, there's, I give you all the references here, and I can cover all these. There's a lot of references in this whole book, that, uh, handout I gave you, so you've got a lot of references to look at here if you want to go through them. We'll touch on some. But the Old Testament saints. Okay. So if you move on, it says uh, what I got here from uh, Tim LaHaye. He says, Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6 is the only passage that labels the believer's resurrection. It is important to understand there are two phases of Christ's second coming. What is the first coming? The rapture. To call us out of here. And when he does that, where does he go? He's, he's, we go to him, right? We are called up to him. The second coming is referred to, we talked about this last week. The second coming, he comes down with us, and all the saints come with him, and to do what? Do what? Set up his kingdom, right? Armageddon takes place, a few other things, a lot of things taking place almost a short period of time, and our little minds trying to grasp all these things to take place, but they take place there, coming back with him. So there are three phases to the resurrection of believers. The church, which we talked about, the seven years later, the Old Testament saints, and finally, the tribulation saints. And John merges them. He says here, and I thought it was interesting, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. First resurrection. The term first resurrection in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, does not describe a single event, but as we just said here, uh, all these others are involved here. 
go down where it says there, Christ was the first fruits of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 15, verse 20. Some of the, those who were resurrected right after Christ was resurrected. Remember, they're in Jerusalem, those who were resurrected momentarily. New Testament saints that are raised, of course. Tribulation saints are, that were martyred. We talked about that. Old Testament saints. All of those are resurrected. Part of the first resurrection. Now, I'm not going to talk about the second resurrection until we get to that later on, but we know there's a second resurrection, which is not the good one, right? The first resurrection is the good one. The second is not the good one. I put this chart here for you, kind of visualize. You know me, I love to visualize things. I put a chart here to help visualize this a little bit about when Christ is the first fruits, the New Testament saints, then the Old Testament saints, and the tribulation saints. And, of course, you see far to the, the black box over there is for the unbelievers, which is part of the, which is the second resurrection time that takes place for the unbelievers there. So the millennium. This is where the bulk of this lesson covers through, is through the millennium. And I got several verses, references here we're talking about, and I try to pull a lot of this together. Because if you look, and it says right here, the term a thousand years occurs in our chapter six times. I don't know if you saw that now. In this chapter here, you saw that in verses 2, there's a list here, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, you see reference to a thousand years. Okay? And of course, three out, three out of those are re- related to Satan. Two of them are related to the reign of the saints with Christ. And the sixth one intimates the period between the resurrection of the saints and that of the wicked. Though the word millennium doesn't appear, it's the reference to the thousand years period of there. Now, we've talked about this before. Very, one of our first lessons, remember one of our close, the very, one of the first lessons when we talk about millennium, the viewpoints. Don't burn those wheels up thinking too hard. Right. Post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, and what? Amillennialism. So what is amillennialism? If I say the word, I don't know get all the letters together. What does that mean? No, no millennium, period. Spiritualized. What's the post-millennium? I'm sorry? After the thousand-year reign, right? But what do we believe in? Pre-millennialism, right? Before Christ comes, the reign, we believe in pre-millennialism, do we not? Okay? That's our stand with this. I put this, I found this, and I, I was thinking of this, and I said, okay, well, I found this, made it simpler to show this. I was trying to, how can I show and illustrate this? And I came across this. According to Jewish, and this is part of Sir, uh, Walter Scott's book on his commentary written back in the, in the uh, long time ago, <laughs> late 1800s, early 1900s. According to Jewish reason, there's six millenniums. Six millenniums. How long has the earth been around? You evolutionists are going to think, well, let's do a couple of billion years, you know, work it out. It'll work out somehow. But according to scriptures, how long has the earth been around? About 6,000 years. Okay? So according to Jewish reason, the six millenniums drawing close answer to the six days in which the heavens and the earth were made, the seventh Sabbatic day of rest, looking forward to that long and blessed Sabbath of a 1,000 years, their viewpoint. Their viewpoint. Which I think is very good to think about because when creation started, before the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world, was born into the world about 4,000 years or so ago. So something to think about there. So the purpose. Now, I know I only got one slide here for the purpose, but we'll talk about the characteristics, which also kind of tie in with the purpose as well. But one of the key things about the purpose is these, co- these covenants that are here, I think. Uh, and like um, Dwight Pentecost. I don't know if you've ever seen Dwight Pentecost's book. And it's about that thick. Huge book, a lot of things it covers. It covers a lot. It covers a lot of this about there. And if you've never seen a copy of that book, um, it goes into a lot of detail, a lot, a lot of things, of course. But he says a larger body of prophetic scripture is devoted to the subject of, of the millennium than any other subject. This millennial age in which the purposes of God are fully realized on the earth demands considerable attention. And he talks about here. Much has to been has been talking about previously. He talked about the age. But he says he's talking about here uh, the, about the fulfillment of these covenants here. Now you see the Abrahamic covenant, the, the Palestinian covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the promises, the new, te- the new covenant. 
and the references here I have for you that. These were promises that God made, and yet they haven't been fulfilled yet completely because Israel is not in total possession of their land and come to peace. There's not peace and all these things falls into that. Um, so there's quite a bit here, and I didn't want to spend a lot of time into that, but I just want you to get the idea to think of that, and that's why I put them right here so you can go home and do a little homework and go back and read and study and don't ask me questions next week. <laughs> No, if you have questions, we'll talk about it then. But I, I just, I got so much to cover here, and that's why I didn't want to put all that. But just kind of give you the highlights of this, that's involved with this. So the characteristics, and I think the characteristics are important to understand here, these things. That, and, the, and David Cloud, and I took from his other book, uh, The Future According to the Bible, because he does a lot about the uh, millennium period, about all of that. And he pulls all this together. He takes from Isaiah, he takes the passages from Isaiah, talks about from Jeremiah, talks about the book of Psalm, Psalm 72, I think it is. And he pulls those out to show things about the millennium period about that. So that's what these are that you're going to see on these slides here. These are just the, the main bullets and the main parts of the scriptures he, he referenced to. But all the other words in between I did not put here, of course. But that's for if you ever see the book, you'll see all those in there between that. But he points out here, the central focus of the kingdom is Christ himself. Now, the Lord's going to be in control. It's going to be his kingdom he'll set up on this earth as well. And he is the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is in control of everything. Uh, talks about here the future, the rule that he will set up on this earth. We'll talk about the government here in a, in later on as well. Uh, Christ's return to the kingdom of this world will return to the rightful owner. Christ's kingdom will be returned to the visible presence of God on earth. Faith will become sight. All authority will flow from Christ's throne. Christ's throne would be situated in the temple and would be glorious. And these are all the references here that you see in this. He talks from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Now that over there you saw was from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2. Th- Let's go turn there. Let's turn to Isaiah. I'm going to hold my place here. Is this over? Isaiah chapter 2. Oh, oh, oh. And he shall come and, uh, he shall, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into, unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall bear, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn, learn war anymore. Christ's kingdom, as you see here, will be a worldwide theocracy. That means what? Theocracy means what? Come on. Theocracy. God's in control. God's rule, right? He's ruling. Christ's kingdom will be a kingdom where ruled by God's word in which he will be the law of the, the world. Think about that. Think about when the Lord is controlling the world and he's ruling. There's no light like, debate there's no, all this political turmoil that we see around us on the news, and we get inundated with so much junk on the news about this politician and that politician, and all that stuff goes on. That's not going to be, you won't see political commercials. There won't be political commercials anymore. You know, that kind of junk going on all the time. Because the Lord is in control. He's ruling. I know I try to make light of that, but we get, we get inundated with so much junk anyways, you know but to see that the Lord is totally controlled with everything that goes on, ruling. From Jeremiah, this is chapters 30 through 33, so there's quite a bit of territory here. He points out, following the time of Jacob's trouble, which will occur during the tribulation, the reign of the Antichrist, God will defeat Israel's enemies and restore her to the place of her blessings. As we talked about last week about the Battle of Armageddon, of course, um, because what happened at the Battle of Armageddon? What, who was, what happened? What's, what's the, some highlights of the battle? 
get it from you. You were here last week, those who were here last week. What were some of the highlights of the battle of Armageddon? You don't have to go down the details and all that. Just a highlight. Should be a quick highlight that you should know about. Okay. All right. The Lord came back, comes back with his saints, okay, and defeats the armies. And what happens? They're all defeated and laying around. Okay, we're defeated. The great supper. The great supper for the birds to come and eat the flesh of all those who were destroyed, all the wicked that were destroyed. Also, what happens? I'm surprised you didn't caught on that. Who the two guys, two entities, were immediately taken and cast away? And. We got guests here, and they're wondering, what did these people learn last week? Did they learn anything last week? Man, this is rough. The Antichrist and the false prophet were immediately cast where? They didn't pass death. They skipped death and went straight off the lake of fire. That's where they were taken, right? Boy, y'all looking bad this morning. All right, I don't want to ask you too many questions. We'll move on. But you see here in Jeremiah, he talks about all these things. About, and, and I'm trying to point out what David Cloud points out, these things about these passages about the millennium that we're seeing throughout the scriptures there. Okay, so let's go move on here. So in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 10. Now let's turn there. That's a short passage, and we can read that a little bit, I guess. So let's turn there. Chapter 11, 6 through 10. And I know y'all, y'all have probably have known about this because you see that little picture there I put in there for you. But uh, it says, the, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion, the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockerel's Den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all, in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of knowledge of the Lord and the waters over the sea. Verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an instant of the people, and, and, it, shall, shall, and it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. This is going to be a great time. It's going to be a great time points out here. In Christ, their kingdom will be reign of peace within the animal kingdom. Uh, in Christ's kingdom, the knowledge of God will be over the entire earth. In Christ's kingdom, Gentiles will trust in him. This picture here, I thought was, I came across is really interesting. It was, I don't know what time, in the 1800s, a guy named Edward Hicks. I put that over there too. So it's called the peaceable kingdom about kids just, and the animals just being peaceful time period. It's hard for us to fathom because what we see today, we're so used to what we see today to think about what it's going to be like in the millennium. I thought about that passage where the Lord said, I have not seen or ear heard. You know, we, we don't, to grasp what the Lord has prepared for us, even in heaven, what he's prepared for us as well. But for this time in the millennium, what it's going, how great it's going to be. So moving on. In Christ's kingdom, good health will be universal. The medical industry will be shut down, and you won't see any more of those commercials anymore. Whew. Isn't it exhausting? All these pills they give you and try to get you to take, and then they tell you all these things in small print that might happen to you if you take these things. Don't read the small print. You know. All that stuff goes on. There would be aging and death in the millennium because there would be people living natural bodies and the man's normal lifespan will increase dramatically. And if you look down there, Isaiah 65, and I put that down there so you can see, there should be no more uh, than an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them, and they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the day of a tree, as the day are, are the days of my people, and mine elect shall enjoy 
the work of their hands. I don't know about you, I've, I've planted a fig tree and it's about this little tall guy. It may take him a long time before he gets any barren fruit, I don't know. We've got some fruit tree experts in here, but how big it's ever going to grow fruit, I don't know. I may not even live to see it bear fruit you know, at that rate. But you think about this in the millennium period, the, time, the, the growth of people, the age of people, it's going to be a thousand years to keep going on and on and on. How many of us have gotten close now or getting closer to what? To the end of our lifespan right now. We don't want to admit it, but we're, we're getting closer. We're not young chickens, a lot of us in this room. Not spring chickens anymore, are we? We just know we're getting closer to the other side and be leaving. But during the millennium, things are going to be back to what? Remember when Adam and Eve, how long did they live? How long, how long did Adam live? How long did Methuselah live? How long did those people live? Hundreds of years, hundreds of years. And while they were living, they were having kids. A couple hundred years old, we got, we got another baby. Okay, keep on moving. <laughs> you know, that's what's going to be different, you know. Because people are going to be born during the millennium. He said, wait a second, wait a second. Where did people come from? We're going to talk about it in a second. Where did people come from? They're going to be born. The occupants, okay? So if you haven't seen that slide, the occupants. There were immortal and immortal souls in the kingdom. In fact, the citizens of the kingdom would be composed of four types. Of course, there will be angels there. Uh, there were born-again Christians who will then dwell in mortal bodies. That are us. Those who are born again. Of course, we'll be having new bodies in Christ. We'll be just like the Lord. There will be resurrected Jews, both the Old Testament and tribulation saints. Okay, we talked about that. But it's also going to be those who will be living in natural bodies. This includes those who will be, be alive on earth when Christ returns and that will enter the kingdom after the judgment of the nations and those who are, been, are born during the millennium. There are going to be people that are, when, when Christ comes back, he's going to do what? We haven't talked about that, but the judgment of the nations, the goats and the sheep nations, and of course the goat nations are cast aside and the sheep nations are going in. There are going to be people that are going to be alive walking into the millennium period who will be on this earth. And of course, they're going to be, have their natural bodies and they're going, to have, they're going to grow, like I said, over time. But in the meantime, they're going to have children and have families and grow like that. That's what's going to be happening to them. So with that in mind, all this growth going on and all this millennium period, what is the government going to be like? Of course, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be in control of everything. But we also know, if you look down in point number five, we've heard this many a time, he's going to do what? He's going to have a rule with a rod of iron. Why? Why? If everything is great in that time, there's a lot of things happening here in the millennium. The land's going to bloom. The productivity's going to be great. You know, as far as everything's going to be just great and wonderful. The Lord's there in Jerusalem and, and the temple's there. And it'll be a great time. The presence of the Lord will be right there. And those of us who, you know, we talked about this earlier, those of us who are saved and born again and with, the, with the saints, talked about earlier, like you saw here in verse, uh, let me go back to Revelation, Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones and, and they sat upon them and the judge, judgment was given unto them. We'll be judging on this earth. But why? Because there's those people who are born, who come into the millennium in their physical bodies, are saved, and they're going to be born children born of them. But what's also something about them? Those born children, what's going to be about them? They're going to still have what? The old sin nature is still going to be there. It doesn't mean once the millennium takes place, there's no sin nature around. Satan is not around. To do what? He's not around to deceive for a thousand years. But inside people's heart is still that sin nature is still there. And those people have to trust Christ also as their Savior. The great part is that they can see him if they want to. They can see him if they want to. Go see him and talk to him and have that privilege of seeing him. And I believe during the millennium people have to get saved as well during that period of time. Because they have that sinful nature with them. 
I'm going to skip through some of this here in a second. But let's move on. So you see these things. He will rule universally, absolutely, in righteousness, in justice, and with a rod of iron, in mercy and grace, and all these things. Let's move on. In peace and glory and prosperity, a kingdom filled with pleasure in the, in the midst of worship. We'd be an active kingdom eternally. Our little minds cannot grasp some of this because how great it's going to be in the millennium period with the, in the presence of the Lord with all that he's doing here on this earth. But also there's going to be people that are born, have come into the millennium, they're born, they have kids, grandkids, and this goes on. But they have what? That sinful nature with them. The Lord still has going to control with a rod of iron. Okay? Um, your sweet little kids are not always sweet little kids, are they? We all know that. What would you say, Brother Brian? Oh, not all of us have goats. <laughs> oh, you got we got perfect sheep. I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it should be evident. I'll flip to the next slide. It should be evident that the millennium is the time of the fulfillment of Israel's national covenant blessings, during which time God will make a divine display of the absolute authority of divine government through the rule of the Messiah. During which time living men are being subjected and tested by the authority of the King. The millennial age is designed by God to be the first test of fallen humanity under the most, what? Ideal circumstances. Don't you ever hear that? Well, you take these people and you move them to a new neighborhood and it's great. It works out great. Just put them in a brand new neighborhood, no matter what. Just, just move, build some new houses, put them in a new neighborhood, and it will be great. Their lives will be great. Does it work? doesn't work. Maybe for some, but not for all. Because of why? What's down in the heart? What's in the heart? Okay? So here, it's an ideal circumstance, surrounded by every en enablement to obey the rule of king. Think about that. In the millennium, you, you could go to Jerusalem, you know, travel to Jerusalem, there's, there's the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't understand, I do not understand how all this works. But if he's ruling from the temple there in Jerusalem, I don't understand. But everybody can come and talk to him, come to him if they want to. And everything, but it says here, uh, from the outward resources of temptation have been removed. Why? Because Satan has been where? Bound for a thousand years. So that man may be found and proved to be a failure, even this last testing of fallen humanity. Moving on. If men sin during the millennia, it will not be on account of having been deceived. It was simply because of what? Self will and the yielding to the lust of their own hearts for we need to remember that the kingdom age is not to be a dispensation of sinlessness there will be some even in that blessed time who will dare to act in defiance of the will of God but such, such will soon be dealt with in conjunct judgment such cases will I take it to be exceptional but, Christ, but scripture this is what Ironside said makes it plain that there will be offense even when God's King reigns over the earth. That's hard to fathom. The Lord Jesus Christ, and, and just like he said earlier, the ideal, uh, the, the fantastic world of the time, there's still going to be those who defy and try to do things against the Lord. Because we know later on what's going to happen, because when Satan's turned loose for a little season, we haven't got to that point, but you already saw it referred to later on about what happens there. But it's hard to fathom this ideal environment because there's still people have in their hearts rebellion. The worship. Some people wonder about the worship, and that one aspect of the worship, the aspect of the worship, uh, of Jesus, one aspect of Jesus' thousand-year reign would be uninhibited worship and adoration. But scripture indicates our worship would be centralized in Jerusalem in a rebuilt temple, this fourth temple that would be rebuilt. Um, there would be animal sacrifices. Wait, 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 wait. Why animal sacrifices? Hasn't Christ already fulfilled? Hmm? I don't think that's the reason, but that's a good shot. 
I put it in here later on for you. The four temporal, uh, where's it down here? Because you see here the next bullet. The four temple, which this is the four temple, and are in no way a reinstatement of the Mosaic law or a replacement of the precious, sufficient, eternal sacrifice of Christ made for us when he died for us. It doesn't replace that. Instead, it's possible the sacrifice served as a reminder, symbolic, of what Christ has done for us. Now, I put a picture here just like we got our, this do in remembrance of me. Because why do we do that? Do it in remembrance of the Lord. What do we have here? We have the Lord's Supper, do we not? And we do baptism as, you know, immersion, baptism. These are done for remorse, are they not? Just like he says here, I think it's very symbolic in the death of Christ for as much the Lord's Supper does, not, does, does for us today. Purely symbolic, not slavic, which means for salvation, not for salvation. First, Salvation during the millennium will be by faith in Christ's finished work of, of atonement just as today. Second, worship by all the saved will be basically the same as today, though the exercise of faith in and adoration of God. Third, because the majority of people will be, uns- the majority of people will be saved and because of knowledge of a, a, an interest in the things of God will be normal, there will be no need of an organization like a church like we have today. Rather, people will worship out of sincere hearts and of a daily experience. Fourth, because Christ the King will rule of Jerusalem and because memorial sacrifice will be conducted at the temple, the natural desire will be to go there and to frequently for special occasions of worship. That's what Leon Wood said. Here is an is a art, art, artist's rendition of what the uh, temple of Ezekiel talks about in chapter uh, 40 through 48 in detail. Ezekiel's temple is known as the fourth or the millennial temple. The glorious vision of Ezekiel uh, reveals that it is impossible to locate its fulfillment in any past temple. We talked about that before, about the past temples that have been created over time. Solomon's temple, temple of, um, during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. The sacrificial system is not, instit- is not reinstated, reinstituted as Judaism, but the establishment of a new order that has its purpose and the remembrance of the work of Christ in which all salvation rests. The literal fulfillment of Isaiah's Ezekiel's prophecy will be the means of God's glorification and man's blessing in the millennium. I believe the sacrifices are there to point to people, this is what Jesus has done. This is what had to have been taking place. This doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Christ has done all that. But it's a picture, it's a remembrance to that. Okay. Conclusion. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. That comes from Psalm 67, verse 4. How our broken world, plagued by cruel dictators and, and impotent, it should be and, impotent rulers, awaits the coming of one who will control the world's thrones as he sits on the throne of his glory and who will enforce peace and justice throughout the whole world. Then the nations will be glad and sing for joy as Christ judges righteously the people of the earth. And I, part of that quote is from Psalm 67, verse 4. There will be no duplicity, trickery, intrigues, and lust for power presently characterizing so many who try to govern. Herbert Lockyer wrote this from his book about the messianic prophecies. And this is back in what, early 1970 or so when he wrote all this. There will be no, God's king will be of the highest throne owned by the myriads of angels and the multitudes of men throughout the universe as their rightful Lord. We talked about this, what's going to happen. But when the Lord comes and, and sets up this kingdom here on the earth, the millennium kingdom, he's in control of everything. But there's going to be those, we'll talk about that, in the, I think next week we get into that. There are those with a rebellious heart going on. But the idea of the environment of the millennium, the perfect environment for those you would think, those who are lost, go and see about Christ and see what he did. And, and you know, but still reject him. It's hard to understand. To understand that. Anybody have any comments, any questions? I went for the first bill, but I think we're kind of beat it a little bit. 
Any easy questions? Nothing from Brian, but anybody else? Anybody got easy questions? <laughs> anybody? Yeah, Brother Tim. Right, yeah. The sacrifices don't save anybody. Yeah, right. But it's the picture of it. Good point. Looking back toward what Christ has done. Good point. Anybody else? Anything else? I did notice something in this room. This side is a little thin over here. Is there a, I mean, y'all did, you know, y'all don't like each other? I don't but got distracted with that part. Anybody else? Anybody else got a question and comment? All right, you see what chapter we're on? Chapter 20. Lord willing, we'll be on chapter 20 next week on the rest of this chapter and get through that. But I, I did want to pull this in about what I had gathered from about the millennium because it doesn't... That's an interesting point about that. Let me just do a summation on that. On just chapter 20, you see there's six references to the thousand years. For an event that's supposed to be and which is going to be grand and glorious is the millennium kingdom. But there's nowhere in, the new, in, in Revelation it really talks about it as such. It just talks, refers to the thousand-year period. And that's why I was trying to point out these other references in the Old Testament, a lot of Old Testament references talking about the second coming and about the uh, millennium period. So I tried to pull that together to see that. I just thought it was interesting how the Lord in Revelation, he just uses six verses here, talks about the thousand years. All right, let's go, Lord, in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and our lives. Help us, Lord, as we study your word and to understand your word and to, understand, to, to apply it to our lives. Not just, not just learning things, Lord, but to, to apply it to our lives to be a, have a burden for souls, the people we deal with, we meet, and where they're going to spend eternity at. Help us, Lord, how to witness to our people, and uh, the neighbors and people we come across with each and every day. And there's somebody lost this morning, Lord. They realize how lost they are and they need to be saved. And not to put it off. Help our pastor, Lord, the strength and the grace and the wisdom he needs this morning as he leads us and, and uh, tries to take care of us, Lord, and the help and encouragement that he needs all the time. Helping the uh, children's ministry, they're getting ready to go on here shortly. The children's uh, church is getting ready to start as well. And the bus ministry as they get ready to go home later on today. Just thank you, Jesus. Your precious name, thank you. Amen.